Um, <laughs> oh, I, I, I won't start that again. Um, yeah, where, 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 where was my thought? Um, um, actuaries and data scientists work fairly closely together. Um, I'm part of the uh, Institute of Actuaries Data Science Practice Committee, and we're always looking at ways to work better in terms of using um, data science tools and techniques and educating the membership as well in those areas. And also um, showcasing some of the work that they do. Um, thank you for, for coming and supporting this event. And I'll ask Eugene, who is the one of the, the founding um, man of the Data Science Sydney group, um, to come to the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for your... Uh very uh, helpful and brief introduction, as always. Um, and welcome, everybody, to uh, what looks like our second last event for the year. And I have to say, um, it's probably a reflection of the success of this event that there are very few spare seats. I don't think we've ever seen this before. I think there are actually fewer seats than people for the first time in this venue. So give yourselves all a big hand for making that <laughs> Um We live in a world where lots of things happen, and for many of us, the last week has been one of uh, unusually intense news cycles. For those of you who've been following... Uh, the open AI controversy, you'll know what I'm talking about. So I thought as a community service announcement, something I saw on the news, and those of you who are also terminally online will know, and the rest of you won't, Sam Altman is CEO of open AI again. So, I'm not joking. This is not a joke. I'm serious. Sam Altman is CEO of open AI again. The board has changed. The only board... Uh, the only board member remaining is the Angelo, and now Larry Summers and I think is it Brockman are also acting board members. Um, beyond that, your guess is as good as mine. Why was why was Brockman fired in the first place? There's lots of speculation, but I think anyone knows. Anyway, um, stuff stuff a data science meetup would be interested in. On on to. Uh, happier things. Um, so yeah, it's a happy thing that we have such wonderful turnout, and that's all thanks to you. Um, who's here for the first time, by the way? Quite a few of you. Um, I know enough set theory to figure out how many of you are not here for the first time. <laughs> the sort of things you do when you're a data science person. Um, well, let's, um, let's introduce the first speaker, and uh, I've... Uh, met him several times now, and he's become quite a regular in this group, and I think a presentation by him is long overdue, even though he hasn't been coming for many years, but he's been certainly uh, certainly making his presence felt. Um, he is um, uh, cer certainly a, uh, an accomplished individual, Anthony. Um, he's got a PhD in molecular biology, I believe, but it's actually... Um, surprisingly mathematical in nature, and after his PhD, he, I believe, did a postdoc in Imperial College, London, and on top of, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm supposed to say nice things about you, so I will, <laughs> and apart from that, apart from that, he's a qualified actuary, and apart from that, he holds a, man a man managerial position in KPMG. These are all distinguished, prestigious positions, and I think we'll actually rather enjoy the topic of his talk. Um, I've often <laughs> rather facetiously said to people, look, if you really want to understand data science, you need to know two things. You need to know data, <laughs> and you need to know science. And there's, there's a facetious side to it, and there's a tragic side to it. The tragic side is that it's absolutely true, and it needs saying because a lot of people who are doing data science spend a heck of a lot, don't spend a heck of a lot of time actually looking at data. 
they'll put data through algorithms. They know how to run things in Python, but they don't actually look at data or understand what the data is saying. So knowing data is important. But there's a lot of people who actually know data and know maths really well. I mean, we're talking gurus, we're talking Kaggle champions, and these folks still aren't that good at science because science is really hard. And science, like logic, is one of those things that everybody thinks they know, but actually very few people do. So the, the, the topic of this talk is actually a very, very important topic. Over to you, Anthony. Thank you very much for that introduction, Eugene. Um, I will, I'll just get straight into it. I'm gonna start, now, what, one thing I would say is I was hoping to be able to do this topic in PowerPoint, but I'm doing it in PDF, but that's okay. I'm gonna start with the acknowledgement of country, acknowledging, I think we're on the lands of the Gadigal people here. Most of this talk was actually written on the lands of the Wangal people uh, in the modern day Sydney suburb of Concord, where I live, and it's very close to uh, an area known as Breakfast Point, which was that, that photograph on the left there, which I took one evening as I was walking my dog. It's a, it's a very beautiful part of the world. It was the site of one of the very first cordial interactions between the indigenous people of the area and the, uh, the English when they first uh, arrived in 1788, and, and they, they shared a, a very pleasant breakfast with each other, um, hence the name Breakfast Point. It's actually also the site of one of the last remaining punts in, in Sydney. There's one in Breakfast Point and one at Wiseman's Ferry, and you can see there that photo, cars can actually drive onto that and cross over Parramatta River free there. It's, it runs back and forth, uh, so it's a very nice so I pay my respects to the uh, original custodians of, of that land and, and the lands of where we are today uh, as traditional custodians of the land we're described where we are. So as Eugene mentioned, I have had uh, a couple of different, well, I'm, I'm basically on my second career in life. I started off as a scientist, having done a PhD in biochemistry. Um, I then went on and did a postdoc at Imperial College. I did another couple of postdocs at Neuroscience Research Australia and then down in Victoria as well in the public sector. Um, before moving, before deciding to change career, I'll, I'll touch on that in, in, a, in a minute, uh, moving to Quantium. I worked at Quantium for about five and a half years and then uh, moved to KPMG about four and a half years ago working in the Lighthouse team and also uh, I'm now a director in the actuarial team. Um, but we, we have a small advanced analytics team within the actuarial team at KPMG where most of the work we do is data science applications in, in the public sector and, and, government and, uh, and health. So I'm going to start this talk today by asking, first of all, you know, what, by trying to define, first of all, what is science? What do we mean when we use the word science? And the simplest thing is to remember that it comes from the Latin word scientia, which means knowledge. So science, it's through science that we actually know stuff, right? That, that's how we actually get to know the difference between what is real and what is not real through scientific endeavor. So uh, does anyone know without reading what's on the right-hand side of the screen. Does anyone know what that molecule is? W would anyone have known that by just looking at it? Any chemist in the room? Anyone did chemistry in university? Chemical engineering, but I wouldn't recognize it. What is it? Chemical engineering, but I wouldn't have recognized it. Oh, you wouldn't have known. Oh, okay. Nitric acid. Not nitric acid. That's very close, though. It's not nitric acid. Anyway, it's urea, right? And urea is the major nitrogenous component of urine. And it's a very important um, molecule because it helps us safely metabolize nitrogen containing compounds such as ammonia, which will be highly toxic to us. But that, that's a story for another slide. Um, but I've got this quote here from this scientist named, named Friedrich Bowler from 1828, when he said, I must tell you that I can make urea without the use of pigments, either man or dog. Now, this was actually a really important moment in for, for humanity because it marked the end the, or the beginning of the end of this concept of vitalism. Somehow they, they you know, for, for many, obviously, you know, humanity believed for a long time that we were made for some, from different stuff compared to, you know, life was made from different stuff compared to inanimate objects like microphones and, and computers and things like that. And this guy managed to create a substance. They knew, they knew about urea, they knew it, it existed in the urine of, of dogs and men, um, but they didn't realize that, that they eventually got to the point where they realized they could actually uh, they could actually get urea in a purely synthetic uh, way 
from uh, chemicals that had come about from non-living things. And so this was you know, quite a confronting moment, but a really important moment in science in terms of advancing the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about our universe. You know? and, and you know, it wasn't uh, too many decades after this that other revolutions came in the way we thought in terms of uh, you know, Darwin's theory of, of evolution through natural selection. We suddenly realized we're actually related to every other living thing. You know, humans thought that they were just great up until you know, they suddenly realized, hang on a minute, we're all not just made from the same stuff, we're actually related to every other living thing on Earth. Um, you know, these things come about through science. And there's another reason why urea is important to me, because in my journey, as I mentioned earlier, I started my PhD quite a few years ago now. The very first paper that I ever published was this one, which was a mathematical model that I built of the urea cycle, right? So going on right now in every single one of your livers is this urea cycle. And it's safely converting uh, the end products of uh, protein metabolism, which include things like ammonia, which would be highly toxic to you if, if this didn't happen, if something goes wrong with your urea cycle. And it converts it using, this is also called the ornithine cycle, because one of the major metabolites that's recycled is actually ornithine. This was discovered by a guy called Hans Krebs back in the 1930s who also discovered a, a number of other cycles. But this was, you know, this was a really interesting piece of work. It was quite challenging for me to work on as a young PhD student because the PhD supervisor I had didn't believe in a theory that had come about through, uh, through some experiments a couple of years prior to that where they discovered that, th well, that they, they, they theorized from looking at what they'd seen that in the urea cycle, metabolites so, so you have, so every enzymic reaction, these, where you see these numbers two, three, and four, these are enzymes that catalyze reactions in the cytoplasm. So citrate becomes arginine through enzyme number two, which I think is uh, arginine synthetase, very imaginatively, imaginatively named. The, normally what would happen in a chemical reaction is things would dissolve out into bulk solvents. So the enzyme grabs the, the molecule and converts it into something else, and then it dissolves out into the bulk solvent and then the next, um, that, that molecule is then captured by another enzyme. What this found was that uh, substrates were actually being channeled directly from one enzyme to another. And my PhD super supervisor didn't believe this. He thought, no, it can't be true. Let's build a mathematical model of it. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get my results to agree with what my PhD supervisor thought. Uh, we eventually reached compromise where I said, okay, we've, we've got to assume some amount of substrate channeling. Um, but this was, you know, I guess I didn't, wouldn't call this data science as such, but I guess this was my sort of first sort of foray into data science because we had some data, a very small amount of data. The, the mathematical modeling was all done in Mathematica, solving big complex systems of nonlinear differential equations, numerical solutions. Um, and, you know, it, it, was, it was applying science in a way to data to get to the truth of something, um, which, I, which um, you know, I'm pretty proud of that I ended up publishing that paper, my first paper. I then moved into my postdoc years. Now, I went looking for photos of myself around this time. I suddenly realized I was, I'm from an age where when I was growing up, my dad had a camera. I had lots of photos of myself as a child from the age of about... 22 from when I moved out of home through to about the age of 25, I basically have no photos of myself at all. I managed to find this one. That's me and my uh, PhD student, Leon Smith, who I worked with at Imperial. This is the laboratory we worked in. We used to use NMR spectrometers. And so in my first post, I just couldn't get away from urine and urea and all these types of things. We used to do a, uh, I, I, I studied a field which is called um, metabolomics or metabonomics we actually used to call it there's a bit of controversy of, of what to actually call it basically what we would do we would we would collect together a lot of samples of things like human urine or blood plasma and we would put them into an nmr spectrometer now an nmr spectrometer is a machine that has the ability to work out the chemical structures of things but you can also use it it's it's very good at actually working out how much of a particular substance you've got there so in human urine, you've actually got thousands of different metabolites that tell you a huge amount about you, about the genes you have, about the, the way you've metabolized the food you've eaten, whether you've had alcohol the night before, whether you've run up and down the stairs, you know, all these types of things actually give you what's called a metabolic fingerprint. And you can actually take that spectrum and digitize it. So we used to digitize the spectrum, you'd get 44,000 different data points, and you could use that to analyze samples, to 
put it all into a big matrix, do multivariate statistics on it to work out what's someone's risk of getting diabetes when you have unknown samples compared to the actual uh, samples we were looking at. So this really was getting a lot closer to what we call data science. Again, no one called them that then, but if you look on LinkedIn nowadays, all of the people that I worked with back then are now calling themselves data scientists. And we used to use one of my favourite techniques, which is principal components analysis. You have to do this for you know dimension reduction and things like that because you just have so many, so many different, um, so many different correlated variables that to try and make sense of it, that's usually the very first thing that you go for. And then we used to use other, other techniques. But th you know there was a lot of work here looking at. Um, making sure we didn't overfit our models and things like that. That was a very important lesson that I learned very early on uh, in my data science career. Now, the challenge that we had with this type of work was that it was, it was quite hard to get grant funding for this kind of thing. When I came back to Australia, I tried to get my research funded. They often said, you know, I, I would miss out on getting these grants and they said, well, you're not really testing hypotheses here. This is a fishing expedition kind of thing. And so it was, it was a bit of a challenge. And what we used to sort of try and retort with all the time was that science, you know, if, if, and, and one thing I've learned over the years, if, if you want to get your research funded in Australia as a scientist, it's got to be hypothesis testing research, right? They're, they're not interested in giving you funding unless, it's, unless you've got a hypothesis that you're actually trying to test. Whereas we used to say, well, there's actually two sides to this, you know, to this discovery of actually getting information. There's hypothesis testing, but there's also hypothesis generation, you know? So, you generate hypotheses by looking at data and, and observing things. And then once you've observed things, you can formulate theories and then start testing those hypotheses. And this whole thing goes in a cycle, right? So, and there's a lot of good reasons why you want to generate hypotheses. Obviously, you know, amongst others, they help counter some of those cognitive biases that exist otherwise. Things like a confirmation bias, where we just go looking for evidence that supports our initial um, beliefs. Then that anchoring effect, which is very similar to it, where we you know, we, we, we have, uh, we remember better the things that are much more recent. There's a really good book about, by Daniel Kahneman about how anchoring effect works in, in humans. Um, and, you know, premature, premature closure and c coming to uh, conclusions too quickly and things like that. So when, we, when we're hypothesizing, you know, it's, it's good to sort of generate as many hypotheses as you can before we, um, you know, to, to help us make sure that we get to the truth of things. Now, there's, you know, you can be quite well rewarded if you come up with hypotheses that then um, turn out to be true. Does anyone know who this is a photo or depiction of? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Newton. Newton. It's not Newton, but that's a good guess. He was a contemporary of Newton. He actually helped fund Newton's published publication of Principia Mathematica. Sorry? Leibniz? No, it's not Leibniz. Who? Kelvin. It's not Kelvin. Sorry? Hook? It's not Hook. <laughs> I'll tell you who it is. It's Edmund Halley. Now, what, what, what did Edmund Halley do as a profession? Astronomy. Astronomy. Sorry? Astronomy. astronomy. Astro who? The number of people that say astronomy is really interesting because he was not an astronomer. <laughs> he was, in fact, it's very relevant that I'm giving this talk in this building right now. Edmund Halley was a, probably the first real actuary. Right? It's really interesting, if you, if you look up Edmund Halley, he actually built the first life table. And he got this table of deaths from Breslau in Germany. And he managed to, he, he even took it as far as working out what the insurance price should be for a particular person based on their age, based on you know, how, the, the likelihood that they were going to die in a particular number of years. So he was, he was a scientist. He, he, was a, he, was a, he was a scientist in the sense that he did a lot of observations, you know, he observed things and he helped generate hypotheses. So what did he have to do with astronomy? Well, very little. In fact, he probably, he may have seen Halley's Comet in his lifetime when he was a kid. He certainly never viewed it through a telescope, but he looked at the data. So what he did, he worked out, he looked back through history. He knew that in 1066, during the Battle of Hastings, that a comet had appeared. And in fact, on the Bayou Tapestry in France, you can actually see a depiction of a comet. You know, it very famously appeared, and then it appeared again, and he looked through the writings, and he, wor he actually worked out the orbit of this comet and worked out that it, it would come back every 76 years. And he said, I hope that, you know, if it comes back in year, you know, whatever the year it was, he knew he would be dead by then. 
he said, I hoped that this comet would be named after an Englishman. And when the comet came back in the year that he predicted it would come back, everyone called it Halley's Comet. And now he's very famous for that. And he's, you know, probably would have been, uh, you know, disappeared into obscurity had it not been for the fact that he had observed this data, made this hypothesis, made this prediction, and it came true. Okay? So great rewards for people who look at data, make predictions, and then, you know, if those predictions come true, uh, it can be very beneficial. So what's part of the motivation for this talk is, you know, um, I've been obviously, as, as I mentioned, I started off as a scientist, then sort of got into the whole data science thing. Now, I, I often see a lot of things like this, and when I joined KPMG as well, you know, I joined this team, the Lighthouse team, where we had a lot of data scientists, and people say, look, who's who in, this, who's who in the zoo around here? Who's a data scientist? Who's an analyst? And you see a lot of people trying to define what data science is and trying to define what a data scientist is. So, you know, if you look at just some examples, like this one from the UNFW website, what's the data scientist versus da data analyst? And things like, oh, AI and machine learning, yeah, okay, human storytelling, business intelligence on the data analyst side, I don't know why that's not on the other side. But, I, I, you know, I used to think, how come no one ever talks about hypothesis testing or hypothesis generation or, you know, trying to unravel the truth of things using you know, uh, uncovering the truth with inside data. And why is a data scientist's salary less than a data analyst's salary? I don't know if you've got that, <laughs> that survey, right? But anyway, you know, data science as well, you know, this, that you, you see a lot of these Venn diagrams, domain knowledge, algorithms, programming. Fair enough. Like, I'm not, it's not that I'm disagreeing with any of these. It's just that, you know, where is the actual science in all of this? You know, I, I, I like, you know, if, if I was forced to do it, I'd, I, I'm actually not giving you a definition of data science in this talk. I'm sorry if, if that's going to disappoint you, but it should have something to do with this, you know, doing what scientists actually do. Because at the end of the day, you know, a lot of you who are data scientists in this room, which I'm sure is most of you, you'll be very familiar with what it's like to actually pull the data together to put a model, you know, to try and fit a model. It might be a GLM or a GBM, whatever it is. You've normally got your X data, which is your predictor variables, and your outcome variables, or the things that you're trying to predict, and you've got columns in that data set. And it's important to remember every single column, like I always try and remind my analysts, every column in your data set, in your predictive variables, is a hypothesis that you're trying to test. If it's not a hypothesis you're trying to test, it shouldn't be in there, right? So if you've got age in there, and you know, fair enough, a lot of people will have the data in there because they've just got the data. Like, let's see if age influences whether or not someone's gonna retire, okay? Well, that probably would. But anyway, each of these things are hypothesis that you're trying to test. This is just one of the things that I'm, you know, I'm always going to great pains to remind people. So, um, you know, this, this garbage in, garbage out thing that, that comes up all the time, this is another thing you see a lot of in data science. And, and it's true. I'm not disagreeing with garbage in, garbage out because it's very true. If your data is rubbish, then you're going to end up doesn't matter how good your algorithm is, it doesn't matter how good you are at fitting models and statistics, you're gonna end up with garbage results. That's true. But you know, you can go to these seminars and things like that, that, that are devoted to garbage in, garbage out, you know, getting spotless data and all this kind of thing. And yeah, that's important. You know, good data is, you, you'll, you'll get nowhere without good quality data. But I always like to use this analogy of this data set that you could potentially, this hypothetical data set that you might wanna build on something like eye color, right? Let's say you have the world's best data set when it comes to eye color. Every single human being in the country, you know exactly what their eye color is and the, and the RGB of it. And you spend a long time, you know, massaging this data and getting it so it's absolutely perfect. But if it's not relevant to the outcome that you're trying to predict, it's useless, right? So it's, it's good to have good quality data, but make sure you're not putting you, too much emphasis on getting your data to be as polished and as perfect as possible unless it's actually going to be relevant and useful to you to actually doing the, uh, you know, trying to predict the thing that you're trying to predict with data science, trying to solve the business problem that you're trying to solve. So how do you go about doing that? And, and again, sorry, this slide's a little bit busy. I was, I was going to step through it, but I'm on a PDF. But, you know, normally what you see, you see a lot of this kind of thing as well on the internet, you know, and I've, I've sort of found this on the, on the Microsoft website, you know, Fabric, this is the data science overview, the data science process. You usually see something like this. It's a bit of a cycle, starting with, you know, the problem to be solved, defining the business problem to be solved. That's true, you always have to start there. And then they say, go into data discovery and pre-processing, experiment and model, 
and iterate, enrich and operationalize, and then you get the insight, right? Fair enough, that's right. But what, how does this actually work practically? So, you know, a lot, like I said, a lot of this is informed by uh, the sort of the exposure that I've had to um, doing data science engagement for, for clients over the years. Uh, you know, this problem definition and defining the problem that needs to be solved is actually a very much a non-trivial step. Sometimes it's pretty simple. Sometimes it's like, you know, why are my customers leaving me? Who, who's, who's, I, I want to predict which customers are going to leave me in the next month. Okay, well, fair enough. But, you know, sometimes we do a lot of work in, in education, for example. Who's actually, which students, you know, we're worried that we're leaving students. Well, we want an early warning system for which students are going to be dropping out of university. So, well, sometimes you need to actually look at the data first and just have, and just understand what is the outcome you're targeting. Because when are the students dropping out? Are they dropping out just after they've enrolled? Are they dropping out before the census date or after the census date? Is it after they've handed in their first assignment, after they've handed in, after they've finished semester one? You know, these kind of things, each one of them is going to be a different outcome and often you'll need, you know, you'd be amazed at the number of times you're dealing with clients who haven't actually looked at the data, who've got an idea that this must be a particular problem for them without actually knowing. So, um, and then the other thing that I'm going to talk a little bit about on the next slide is this idea of the hypothesis generation workshop. You know, this is, this is where the, the magic really happens, getting people, getting all the right people in the room, getting the... The, the SMEs together with the business owners, with the people who know the data, with the data custodians as well, and making sure that you sit down and really nut it out and say, okay, look, here's the problem we're trying to solve. What is it that's actually causing it? And then that helps you get the right data together so that you can actually put all that into your data set and then build the model and then get the, get, get the absolute most out of what you're trying to do. And, you know, and I've got, I've got some other points there. So collect the hypotheses into the data, create the data set, Relax and select the algorithms used. So this is another thing that comes up a lot. You know, people often stress out about what algorithm should I use? You know, should, you know actuaries love GLMs, right? But, you know, they also don't mind using GBMs and, and random forests, and some people want to use, uh, you know, much more sophisticated methods. And I often say to them, look, really, if you're going to, you know, it's great if, you, if you're good at, you know, building these algorithms that, you know, give you that little bit of extra incremental benefit to the prediction that you're trying to get but there's no point unless you've got the right data if you've got a bunch of data that's not predictive of your outcome because you couldn't access it or because you you didn't actually go thinking about what are the features you need to create to actually get to that answer you know it's it's not going to help getting the best algorithm in the world isn't going to help if you don't have the right data that you're trying to use to predict the outcome that you're interested in so this is you know what, what I'm often um, tasked with doing in my sort of day job is working out, look, what, what does the hypothesis generation workshop look like? Making sure the right people are going to be there. You need to have the people who are, usually it's good to have the people who are sponsoring the project. You, you need these domain experts. So you need the people who sort of are on the ground working in this area day to day that can sort of have a conversation with you about, look, here's what I think is really the problem. You know? And I'll give you, I've got a couple of examples on the next two slides of when we've actually done this sort of properly. Um, you know, you need the data custodians, so the people who own the data who can say, yes, I've got this or that or the other. Um, you need the data analysts, so you need people who, who already know the data, who've had a look at the data. And then, of course, you need the data scientists who are going to be um, fitting those models. So usually, you know, sometimes one, I've got one to two hours there. Sometimes you might need a bit longer, depending on the actual problem. Um, agree on an outcome definition. You might need your own workshop for the outcome definition workshop, as, as I've mentioned before. You know, sometimes in, in education you get people saying, oh, well, I know it's a problem because I spoke to so-and-so, the principal down at, you know, Thurwood, uh, at Southern Cross College. And they're like, well, have you looked at the actual data? Are you sure this is a problem? So, um, you know, and then obviously you, you then go through and you, you can explore those hypotheses and, and um, that's often a very good, you know, it's very good starting approach to actually building something together to, to, to get the right data together in the first place to start building out that model. And obviously this is an iterative process. Sometimes the data just isn't available. You need to go ahead and, and do things and just get something that looks right and then go and ask for more data later on, which is, which is another thing that, that happens uh, from time to time. So just a couple of use cases. This was an article that was published in the Australian Financial Review on the 10th of February. Uh, 2019, so quite a few years ago. It's the only time I've um, been written up in the newspaper, I think, as a, as an adult. But um, uh, 
Quantium Lead Developer. I don't know why they called me a developer, but Quantium Lead Developer Andrew Marr, so I do have my name in there. Anyway, this was a very interesting piece of work that we did, which is one of those few examples where we got to do the sort of textbook data science approach that I've mentioned with the hypothesis generation workshop. I wouldn't pretend that every so every single project that I do, we get to do it you know, fully properly and all that, but um, this was uh, a, a problem that they had from apprenticeship network providers, uh, which is the, peop the people who coordinate apprentices um, between the employer and the, and the school and the apprentice themselves. You know, they had a big problem with dropouts, right? Up to 50% of people started dropping out. And we did the hypothesis generation workshop and we, you know, we, we were chatting away to one of the guys who's, you know, on the ground close to it all, who said, you know, things like, um, yeah, they'll, they'll often drop out because they, they get pissed off with their boss around this, that or the other, but it's very unlikely that they're going to drop out if they're working for their dad, you know. So we said, oh, okay, are they, you know, because a lot of them work you know, get, get a job with their dad to do their apprenticeship. So we thought, okay, do you have that information in the data, who, whether or not they work for their father? And said, no. And so we said, can we create, but, but, you know, we put our heads together and we thought, I wonder if we can create a feature in the data set that would give us an indication of that. So one of the features we created was we, we, we had the surname of the employer and we had the surname of the of the apprentice, and we just did a match and found out, you know, just a one or zero. If the if the name if the surname of the employer matched the surname of the apprentice, might not be perfect. You know, Smith is a pretty common name, but interestingly enough, it wasn't the highest. Um, it wasn't the most significant factor in the model, but it was it was statistically significant in the model. So that was um, I thought that was a really interesting little um, you know part of it uh, that. Um, that, that, we, that we managed to do by, by actually doing that properly and, and having that hypothesis generation workshop. That's the kind of thing that can come out of it. Another use case, uh, this, this one, higher education. Um, we, you know, a particular university was interested in student experience and things that influence student experience. Did the hypothesis, uh, you know, workshopped a few hypotheses with them. In amongst other things, one thing that they were interested in was whether or not student patterns, that their attendance patterns on campus could have influenced whether or not they were going to have a good experience on campus, on, on you know, report having a good experience at university. And so I turned to my old friend PCA and I combined a bit of PCA with k-means clustering and we actually discovered four groups of students. You can see them there, that it, based on their attendance patterns on campus over a, over a semester, we have group one down the bottom there, they were the consistent attenders, they were attending pretty consistently throughout semester. Group two, disappearers. They appeared the first couple of weeks, yep, turning up to campus, and then all of a sudden, ah, oh, disappeared, you know, don't really want to keep coming up, coming, turning up to campus. Group three, big finishers, starting off pretty low, but then all of a sudden, the last two weeks start panicking, they start turning up to, turning up to lectures, and group four was the midtermers, these are people that weren't really there at the beginning, suddenly turned up for a while, and then, ah, oh, no, I don't need to keep coming up keep turning up to uni. And the other thing, the other hypothesis that we generated was that students would have a good experience if they shared a lot of classes with other students, right? So these were students who had, would have, we, we hypothesized they would have found it easier to make friends because they were moving from one class to another with lots of other students. And, you know, building these features was really fun because we found this, my colleague found this tool that we could use to visualize the data and that's what this big sort of messy kind of ball is. Each different color is a different faculty and each point is a different class that they were in. So you can see students who do maths, you know, 1002 are very likely to share a class with people who do maths 1001, not very surprising. You know, we, we were going across semesters here. I think we did refine this one a bit. Um, but you can you see the business students all together. I think there's music students up the top there and engineering students somewhere down there, down near the bottom. Um, interestingly enough, when we tested these hypotheses in the model, they weren't significant. So <laughs> they were all explained by other factors. But, you know, it was, um, it's still a worthwhile, uh, worthwhile thing to go through. So, you know, th this, this was using that, um, again, using that proper methodology to go through to, to build up these things. Now, this one, I was going to ask, do you know who this person is? But I think his name's there. So uh, Bongo Drums Playing Scientist 
physicist by the name of Richard Feynman, you know, I always sort of stressed out a little bit about the whole philosophy of science because I've got a PhD in biochemistry and I'm a, I call myself a data scientist. And I realized, you know, I never took a, I never took a course in um, philosophy of science. I could, they, they had these courses available to us at, at university. I just never took it. I was more interested in maths and biochemistry and things like that. So, um, and I was very relieved. So Richard Feynman is one of the best scientists, of the greatest scientists of the 20th century. He, he, you know, he helped out on the Manhattan Project and he was there at the first test of the atomic bomb and things like that. And he's a great philosopher of science. There's a fantastic series of lectures on YouTube, which if you're interested in, in science and physics, have a look at it. There, it's crappy old black and white footage, but it was a series of six lectures that he gave at Cornell University in the early 60s. And they're absolutely brilliant. They're all available on YouTube. And he does talk a lot about philosophy of science. So I thought that this guy must have been one of the best philosophers of science going around. But I did find this quote um, that he said, which I thought was very interesting. The philosophy of science is as useful to scientists as all an ornithology is to birds, right? So the philosophers are a bit, you know, angry at him for saying this because, and, and I don't think that he was trying to have a go at philosophers in general. I think what he means by this is, you know, don't get too stuck in philosophy. Just get out there and do it. You know, don't, don't, don't be afraid. You know, d don't ever be afraid to just get out there and, and do the experiments and, and fit the models and things like that because you, you, you're going to get nowhere if you get stuck in a philosophical kind of confusion. Um, and then, you know, as my second last slide tonight, th this, I thought this one, I, I remember when this paper came out. So this one on the, on the left-hand side here, it's, it's called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. It came out in 2005, and it caused quite a stir when it came out. Um, and this is all freely available online. It's published in, in FOSS Medicine, which is a publicly available journal. So it's a really interesting read, because what this guy did, he, he looked at you know, the way science works. And it's not really the way science works. This is the way academia works. And it's important that we make a distinction between science and academia because things that get published in the peer-reviewed literature, he found out they were actually more likely to be false than true, which is really quite a confronting thing when you're, when you're a scientist. Um, because, because of this concept, and there's been a few other papers published, I've got another one here, the extent of consequences of p-hacking in science. So, as we all know, I'm sure anyone here who knows anything about statistics knows that, you know, when, when we say that a, a result is statistically significant, we're just making a probability statement saying, well, the probability is less than 0 0.05. But we know that if we do that 20 times, well, you know, one of them's probably going to be false, right? So we're, we're going to mistakenly uh, reject the null hypothesis. And, you know, it, it turns out that a lot of these things are actually false. So it's, it's important just to sort of remember this, and I've got this thing on the, on the right-hand side there, you know, a movement to try and counter this now is, is pre-registration of, of your hypotheses, because otherwise people, you know, a lot of the stuff that's published, particularly in the social sciences, I think that they're, they're a particularly bad uh, case of it, they, they have p-values that are just below 0.05, and, you know, uh, believe me, uh, there's plenty of people who sit there and go, well, I can't publish this because the p-value's 0.1, let's do a few more experiments to see if we can get the p-value down to below 0.05 and then we can publish, right? And so, you know, you, you, you're, you're getting lucky by getting your p-value down to where you want it to be. So I think this is an important reminder that a lot of the work that we do in data science, you know, because the way science works is you don't know that something's true until, you know, you go through this process that there's another, you know, speaking of philosophies of science, Karl Popper would say, you know, that you've got to have results that are independently reproducible and you eventually need to reach some sort of consensus, you know. So the way science works is you, you eventually, scientists who are publishing the field will have conferences, well, they'll, they'll eventually find some sort of consensus. Now, in data science, the analogy here is to remember that, you know, we do, particularly those of us who work in consulting, we do do a lot of work for clients where we're producing work. We want to make sure we do our best for them. And we want to make sure that, you know, what we're saying to them is true and, and some, something that's real that's actually really going to help, help them with their business. Because we do have the opportunity, you know, I do a lot of work in the, in the health space and, you know, we, we like to try and apply these data science methods to see if a particular intervention is actually valuable, if, if is it worth 
the government's money to actually be paying for a particular, you know, to build a new hospital or a particular drug on the PBS and things like that. So it is very important that we're careful about the, uh, the work that we do and making sure that we can um, do things the proper way so that we can actually really get to the truth of the matter with these things. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. You know, just a reminder that data science involves implying those science, at least in my opinion, happy to hear dissenting opinions. This, you know, applying those scientific and scientific methods, hypothesis generation. So I, I usually think of this as the bit where you're doing the data analytics and those unsupervised methods. Hypothesis testing, when you're applying those stats and ML to sort of, you know, try and make those probability statements both of which are great value in gaining that knowledge from the data, which is what it's about at the end of the day. And it's a team effort. You know, remember those outcomes definition workshops. If, if, if it's your job to be designing those sort of projects, for if, if you're in consulting or those of you, you know, probably need to do this in-house as well. Um, you know, and remember every column X in your data is a hypothesis that you're testing. Thank you. Hey, I was, thanks for the talk. Uh, one thing I was just talking to my esteemed younger colleague here was when, when I got my PhD, now I'm an old man, uh, we were required like Kuhn's structure of scientific revolution, Popper. So we were required, even though it was a, wasn't a philosophy of science PhD, but we were required as part of our PhD to do that. I'm wondering, did anybody else have that or is it just old people like <laughs> Or did you do it after, you did it after the fact? With I, no, I, I never did. I never took a course. And during my PhD, we were never required to do anything around methodologies of science or anything like that. So yeah. this, this is all stuff that I've sort of reflected on and, and read about. Um, but, uh, well, if you haven't done the Kuhn, the one with the consensus, the, when, you know, the falsification, the, the Kuhn, I have Thomas that. Kuhn, anybody else? The structure of scientific... I was research. actually wondering whether Feynman's derogatory comment was based on Kuhn's theories yeah. rather than anything serious. Okay. I mean, it could easily have been aimed at Lakatos as well, because there was that period, there was a lot of social philosophers of science who basically said, science is just like any business, like any other social practice, including astrology. So um, I, I imagine that was actually a barbed comment, particularly at Lakatos. Right. Thank you for your life story. It really resonates with me. We should have a chat later. Um, <laughs> I, I'm wondering about your opinion about how the hypothesis testing goes into data science, because it's like, are we just testing hypothesis with just looking at the data? Are we really in danger of looking for correlation and not causation here? I was a bit disappointed in the talk. I thought you were going to talk about things like randomized control trials and actually doing experiments to test your hypothesis instead of just trying to prove hypothesis from purely looking at your data. So do you have anything to say about that? No. Well, we can maybe talk about that later. But... Yes, let's talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult topic, but yeah, sometimes I, I do wonder whether data scientists fall into the hole of just thinking that we've tested some hypothesis where we've actually just found random correlations, even despite our best effort of having come up with this hypothesis generation step. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the idea is if you come up with enough hypotheses that span the full space of, your, of, of what could be available by looking at all that data, the more hypotheses that you generate and test, the more likely you are to come up with something that is actually correct, rather than limiting yourself to a smaller number of hypotheses that were based on the data that you just happened to have at hand. But it's still not as good as an RCT. It's not as good as a randomized control trial, I agree with you. All right, Th thank sorry, you. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> All right, yeah, great presentation, and it's good to, to point out all elements in the data science are important including the business knowledge which is related to philosophy. So I'll just run to right, I'll write point to some interesting aspect. You know, Nikola Tesla was the, one of the greatest engineers. So he was not scientist, but he was very close to best understanding. And he said one thing um, that actually, uh, you know, the Edison was 
trial and error. So he was far from a scientist. He said he was like, uh, he would diligently go and search for needle in the haystack and actually with a bit more knowledge, he would save thousands of hours. So not knowing actually what you're looking after, just trying, you know, no matter how perfect is the, is the data, no matter how perfect are the methods, you need to understand what you're, what you're solving and why you're solving because the motivation, and in many of those other experiments about the students' motivation to stay, it's many other factors, not just you know what the data tells you, but actually where the logic is guides you so there's lots of things that we don't actually capture and there's lots of bias so in terms of the uh, relationship between philosophy and and science it's, it's a two-way uh, it's like what there's a saying uh, science without philosophy is blind which means you need to know what you're solving but the other way as well philosophy without science is empty that means no matter what you know if you don't test it you, you can't sort of prove your model. So, so actually, it's very important that all those aspects, and because I'm actually sort of working on data sort of uh, management, data philosophy, uh, everything is important. It's not about what you say that the data has to be perfect, but data can be perfect but biased. So what's the point of being perfect? We, we need to know what we are looking at. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Uh, love this topic. Great talk. I just uh, observation on you, you made this sort of comment that you're seeing every variable that goes into a model as effectively as a hypothesis. And I wonder, there was a time in the statistical machine learning literature where they used to refer to models as a hypothesis themselves. They'd say basically there's a hypothesis space. And when you train a model, you're actually generating a hypothesis. So it's not just the features, it's actually every model, all the parameters and its structure is effectively a hypothesis about how the independent variables relate to the dependent variable. Um, so I'm just curious if you, is that something that you see or if you've got any objections to that? Um, I, I don't usually see it that way, but the way I normally see it is the way I would have described it there, where you have everything you're following the data needs to be there for it to be a good hypothesis. <coughs> So um, one thing that you mentioned a bit earlier uh, was you need to explore the full manifold of potential hypotheses, right, in order to know that you've got enough hypotheses there that you're likely to actually understand causal relations as opposed to just go by whatever hypotheses you do have. In this outcomes definition hypothesis generation workshop, how do you know you've got to that point without knowing the final answer of like the causal link? How do you know you've generated enough? enough? I guess I'm kind of asking how, how enough is enough. Yeah. Right? It's a silly question. Yeah. But... I, I think the, the idea of the hypothesis generation workshop is, is to take the reading from some of the other research and then get an end to know what that is actually in the performance. You know, rather than doing the other hand stuff that we've been doing so much, we can see actually when we can start trying to make some basic stuff. Can I sneak in a question? What's the biggest point of resistance that you've noticed to people actually doing it the other way around? Like clearly a lot of people are going from what data they have and what models they can build out of it. What do you find is that point of resistance where people are actually like, this is the toughest thing about doing it the way that you are suggesting that we do it?
something that we know is the same thing. One last question. Oh, hey. Sorry. hey, Anthony, thank you. That was fantastic, by the way. Really appreciate it, bud. Um, one of the touch points you mentioned in there with hypothesis testing and the clients, and I've seen many a data scientist actually quit the industry altogether or go into other areas of consulting just because of the stress of hypothesis testing and actually trying to get a result for the clients and the client not understanding that there is a process and it needs to begin with hypothesis testing in the first place. How do you communicate that with clients? How do you see that is the, the best way to address that in the first instance to say, hey, there might not be an outcome, but that's part of the scientific process in which we're actually dealing with, with your data set? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's usually the case that there's, the client just doesn't have enough data, like they have some data, and they end up with some unexplained variation or that there's a risk that the model could be showing them things that aren't necessarily true. Um, so there is a lot of expectations management there around what they're actually going to get. And usually there's a lot of conversations about here's the data that you should be having. If you really want to do this properly, we should be going and getting that other data from, from those other people over there to actually get to the truth of the matter. Because it does come up all the time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Everything. Yeah. Yeah. everything I've done is he told me to do it. Yeah. Like two days. Sorry, yeah. and he feels like an opinion, and then he just makes this because everyone comes along. There's too much stuff, it's not enough for all the stuff. And then he made this new whole new bro. I need a mole, I'm getting real. And when I say that now I'm just start again on this whole own yeah. Um, and he, he's just like built that skin. Yeah, yeah, but there's no uh, uh, <laughs> uh, And a product train up. They're like, hey, mate, it's cheap. I need to go in. Just going to start it. Like, it was a bit more time. It's kind of. Probably my my I just know when someone. You know, like, it's such a weird way to lead. I'm just blaming other people. Also changing. Yeah, yeah. It's all wrong. Kind of goofy himself. Sydney, particularly in the Actuaries Institute uh, venue, because today is the day when both our speakers are actuaries. And <laughs> Sophia uh, works at Cover Genius doing very actuarial uh, insurance y things. Uh, maybe she can even tell us a little bit about the company when she speaks. I still don't quite understand what it does, and I really should, because uh, um, Dimitri, who works with Sophia, has now presented here twice. I'm still getting my head around what they actually do. Some, something fintechy in life insurance, I believe. Um, so, Sophia is, is an experienced data scientist and actuary who has dedicated nearly a decade to the general insurance industry. She spent many years in large corporations on insurance pricing and integration of data science to the actuarial discipline. Presently, she works at an international insurtech startup company named Cover Genius tackling intricate data science challenges with the aim of pioneering solutions within the ever-evolving insurance sector. I've got to say, that's a very solid profile. Did you use 
chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and we're, we're expecting the the same high high level high high standard in the presentation itself. Over to you. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you, Eugene, for the intro. Um, so I use GPT to write a bit of my file. Um, <laughs> we didn't use um, any GPT to write this one. Um, so it's probably not going to be as good as my file. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so yeah, I'm an actuary, also a data scientist. I work at Color Genius. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what Color Genius does, uh, we are an insured tech uh, startup company. Um, so we partner with a lot of e-commerce businesses like Amazon, um, Booking.com, um, Ryanair to sell embedded insurance products. So yeah, so what got me to do this presentation about easy testing is that uh, when we work with different e-commerce businesses around the world, uh, we do a fair bit of experimentation, a lot of price testing, a lot of easy testing. Um, so, but when we were doing uh, kind of the easy testing practice, we realized there are a lot of materials online, and then some of them are very confusing to use. Um, there's kind of like no special kind of standards around how to do easy testing. So um, here comes the presentation about defining easy testing. Uh, just a disclaimer that I'm not trying to set any kind of standards or any guidelines around exactly how to do easy testing. Um, that's too big a topic. So what I'm trying to do here uh, is to kind of provide some perspectives around uh, A-B testing, um, how to compare different tests, how to specify the parameters, um, and then how to interpret uh, some of the results. So, uh, cool. Uh, so here's an outline um, for today's presentation. Uh, we're going to first quickly talk about what's A-B testing. So some of you may not be very familiar with what that is about. Um, and then we're going to talk about statistical tests as thresholds for hypothesis testing, continuing the conversation about hypothesis testing today. Um, and then we're going to introduce the concept of power curve, what that means, how we can use power curve to interpret a test. Uh, then we're going to talk about the power of the test, um, significance of parameters of the test, and how the variations correlate with changing the power curve. Um, and then we're also going to talk about the impact of early sorting and sequential tests. Um, if we got time, uh, we may or may not kind of briefly cover Bayesian testing. Um, okay, so um, starting with um, what is A-B testing. So A-B testing, um, as you probably already know, um, is kind of a name commonly used for statistical hypothesis testing in the e-commerce setting. So it's a form of randomized controlled trial, um, which we want to define which variance um, is better based on a predefined metric. So um, typically we have two groups. We have a treatment group and a control group. Um, so there's a bit of a confusion around which one is variant A, which one is variant B, um, but for here we'll just say treatment is group B, um, control is group A. So let's say uh, we want to start um, over testing. So we have, let's say, 90% of the traffic that's eligible, and then we randomly put them into different groups. We have a treatment group and control group. So uh, each of them will be 45% of the traffic. Um, so let's say we want to define um, for this experiment, let's say we want to see how the conversion rate changes. So um, in insurance setting, conversion rate is uh, just for the people who have insurance quote what's the percentage that end up purchasing insurance. Yeah, so let's also say uh, with the experiment, uh, the control group had a 25% conversion rate, and the treatment had a very distant group, uh, the conversion rate become 35%. Um, this after we run the experiment for um, a certain duration, we make a conclusion that the treatment is better than control. And then going forward, uh, we'll have all the traffic going through um, into kind of the treatment group. All of them will receive um, the new variant B. Okay, so uh, sorry, this might be a little bit too technical. Um, so 
this is probably going to be a more technical <laughs> presentation compared to the last one, but I promise there's no formulas, um, so that's still okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the data collected by the randomized control trials um, is analyzed using hypothesis testing. So, uh, from an academic perspective, um, it's a surprisingly controversial topic. We have uh, three different underlying philosophies. So uh, there is kind of the first round of philosophy about feature injecting, uh, which is about p-value and confidence intervals. You probably touched um, feature injecting um, from intro set process about uh, linear regression, for example. Um, and then the next one will be about uh, mean and deviation injecting. You've probably heard about MT testing before, uh, which is about the power of the test, about experiment sizing and sequential tests. Um, and then the last one, which is very, very popular in modern kind of industry practice, is about uh, Bayesian testing. Um, so it's based on Bayesian theory, where we have a prior assumption, and then given the data, we want to update the posterior <coughs> probability, and then uh, make a conclusion based on the posterior probability. So a lot of the materials taught in um, intro uh, set process, set 101, um, it's sometimes a blend of feature injecting and mean and deviation injecting. Well, from industry perspective, uh, especially in e-commerce settings, uh, we are very strongly based in the MT testing approach. So, uh, for this presentation, I'm going to cover the uh, mean and deviation testing uh, from a first principle perspective, um, and then we also want to emphasize the importance of power curve, which I will discuss in more detail. What they mean? Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so what does the data look like? Uh, so here um, in the two graphs, we have uh, two simulated worlds. Uh, so the one on the left, uh, that's uh, a simulated world where there is no effect. So we assume that there is no difference between treatment and uh, control. Uh, the one on the right here, that's where we simulate should be a 10% lift between treatment and control. So the left one is the boring world, the right one is the happy world. Um, so what does, how do we look at a graph? So here on the x-axis, that's the sample size. So we plot, uh, oh sorry, on the y-axis, uh, that's the cumulative lift. So the cumulative lift is the cumulative difference between treatment and control. So we plot the cumulative lift over time. So in here, each line is one simulation. So we have 50 different simulations for each of the graph. And then, so we can see on the left, in the boring world where there is no change, uh, there's no difference between treatment and control, uh, the cumulative lift uh, is kind of centered around zero. Uh, it might have quite a bit of a range, uh, but then it still kind of mostly stays around zero on average. Um, the one on the right, where there is a 10% lift, uh, where the conversion rate um, went from 25 to 35%. Also 10% here, we're just using that as an additive lift. Um, so we can see that on average, the cumulative lift increased over time. Uh, does that make sense? I see some confusing faces here. Yeah. All good? Okay, yeah. Oh, so the treatment, uh, it can be any kind of scenario you plot. Let's say you uh, treatment can be a big price decrease or it can be a change in web UI. It can be any kind of um, treatment you apply. So the baseline is 25% conversion rate. That's, for example, based on existing testing of your web UI or existing prices. Uh, the current conversion is only 25%. So let's assume hypothetically some changes were made in the process and then the treatment increased by 10%, so we got a 10% lift. And then in that case, assuming the 10% lift is correct, then this is what the cumulative lift would be over time. So we're not going to detail about what should be changed. Um, that really varies for different type of businesses. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's just keep going. So this is what the data will look like based on two simulated worlds. 
but if you were to run just one experiment, um, then what does data really look like? So what you do is that you only go one victory line at a time. So this is based on your actual data. Let's say uh, you started an experiment um, and then you saw this observation over time. And now what we wanna do is to figure out which world does it belong to. So if we were to overlay uh, the spray graph we just seen together, um, so we can see that uh, we have a simulated path, um, the temperature lift, that's the red curve, um, and then the no effect wall, that's the green one, uh, and then the observation is just somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So this is kind of what data will look like if we compare our observation with our simulations. So from statistical, uh, kind of classical statistical test perspective, um, this is kind of where we want to make decision about for observation. Does it belong to the world where there is an effect or does it belong to the world where there is an effect? So in this case, um, classical test is just about picking a threshold. So um, if the cumulative lift is higher than the threshold, then we say uh, we live in a happy world of um, certain lift. If the uh, cumulative lift is below the threshold, then we say uh, there is no lift, uh, there's no change um, in terms of um, conversion rate for the two potential. Okay. So yeah, so uh, yeah, so this is uh, what will happen to the two different balls uh, once we pick a threshold. Yeah. So on the left one, um, in uh, kind of the Boolean world where. Uh, the three minute control doesn't really differ uh, when it comes to the true lift. Uh, once we pick the threshold, um, there are still some lines that are kind of crossing over into uh, the red zone that's kind of being above the threshold. Um, so those ones are the ones that once we reach our conclusion, the conclusion will be uh, there is a lift for treatment. So those are the ones that will get wrong when there isn't any lift. So here is kind of the concept that you normally hear about um, the significance of the test. So um, here that's a 5%, so that's a type one error of uh, this test. Um, so there's a 5% probability of uh, declaring there is a lift, even though there isn't any lift. Yeah, uh, kind of similarly for the one on the right, uh, for the same threshold, uh, we can see that there are some kind of fall into the red zone where we declare uh, there is a lift for the treatment, but there's some that falls into the green zone. Those are the ones we say there isn't a lift. Yep, uh, so that's uh, uh, kind of the uh, common terminology you hear that's kind of represented by the power of the test. So here in the test, the power is said to be 80%. Um, what that means is that when there is a true effect, there's an 80% chance of us saying, yes, there is an effect. Yeah. Um, you might also have heard about type two error. So that's the type two error of our 20%. Okay. So um, here now we introduce the concept of power curve. So the power curve is essentially summarizing the results uh, from the previous slide into just one simple curve. Yeah, so we start with our threshold, and then based on the threshold, there are some winners, some losers, some true detections, um, some false detections. Um, and then from there, we can summarize into a power curve. Uh, okay, you might not be able to see the label on the x-axis. Um, so here it says true lift. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the underlying true lift uh, for the treatment. So here we see kind of the two most important points on the power curve. Oh, sorry, maybe I'll just explain power curve first. So um, on the x-axis, that's the true lift. On the y-axis, that's the probability of affecting H1. So that's the probability of affecting the, the alternative hypothesis. Or you can think of it as a probability of saying there is a lift. So uh, when there is actually no lift, um, then there's a 5% chance of us declaring uh, there is a lift. So that's the significance of 5%. Um, and then for this test, uh, we decided, uh, so we specified the parameters as power at 10% lift is 80%. So that's when the true lift is 10%. 
there's 80% chance of us getting it right. So that corresponds to the point here. Uh, How do I go full screen? Yeah. Of course, thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so that will be uh, the T point on the power curve. So that is that represents kind of what's the probability of us missing a mistake uh, given the true rate. Yeah, so this is probably one of the most important concepts uh, for today. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, so what to change any kind of experiment settings, how that will affect the power curve. Oops. That, yeah. So what happens if we change our significance level? So before, the significance was set to be 5%. Uh, what will happen if we will change that to be 10%? So uh, increasing the significance of the test from 5 to 10%, essentially means we are kind of lowering the threshold. So the one on the left here, uh, the two brown lines, uh, those two are what will happen if we were to change the significance of the test. So those ones before were declared as no effect, now they are declared as having an effect. So similarly on the one on the right here, the brown ones, uh, those ones are before we say there is no risk, and now we say yes, there is a risk for treatment. And then this is what will happen to the power curve if we were to um, set the alpha equals 10%. Uh, sorry, before I go here, probably should mention that in this setting, uh, we're now changing the uh, size of the test, size of the test is the thing. Um, yeah, so we can see that when we increase the significance of the test, uh, we're essentially shifting the power curve uh, from right to left. So we're kind of doing a bit of trade-off between our true positive uh, versus uh, false positive rate in this case. Yeah. So before, um, the significance is at 5%. Now it's going up to 10%. Uh, and then the power of the test will increase as well. So before, uh, when the true risk is 10%, uh, it's around 80. Now maybe falling to, let's say, 85%. So what if we want to detect some small effect? Uh, one of the common things uh, we discover in income business setting is that uh, if we're making, let's say, a cosmetic change to UI, we may, we're making some buttons bigger, making some buttons change color, uh, we're changing some panels. Um, in this case, uh, the effect we want to detect is relatively small. Um, in this case, uh, if we want to detect smaller size effect, but then we also want to have a certain accuracy when it comes to detecting um, the effect. <coughs> and the simple way to do it is just to run the test for longer so we can get a larger sample. So the one on the top, this is the boring world where there is no risk. Uh, we can see that uh, we got kind of a similar amount of line that go into the red zone. The red zone is where we uh, accept the ultimate trade hypothesis. So that's when we make the wrong decision. Uh, the one um, in the bottom, that's uh, uh, the happy world where there's a 10% risk for treatment. Uh, we can see that we have a lot fewer instances of not detecting the 10% risk. So we have a lot fewer that goes into the green zone. And then this is what will happen uh, for the power curve. So if we just look at the two solid lines for the moment, uh, ignoring the two horizontal dotted lines, uh, so at uh, kind of a 10% true risk, uh, before we we're only able to detect 80% uh, of them. So that's the blue line. Now we're able to detect 95% of them. So that's the orange line. Um, the significance of the test will still stay at 5%. Uh, that's um, kind of uh, just to iterate. Significance is when there's no effect, um, but we say there is an effect. Um, and then the two horizontal lines that correspond to the y-axis on the right, uh, that's the uh, sample size. So it increased from 230 to 500. Yeah. So if you want to detect small effect, um, a simple way to do it is to let the test run for longer. 
Um, another concept uh, that Coleman talks about in EV testing setting is called uh, picking. So picking essentially is um, stopping the test a little bit too early. So once we got a certain significance, um, whatever the significance means in the setting, um, and then we stop the test. Um, so here, that will be kind of a modified decision boundary. Uh, remember before our decision boundaries, uh, it's kind of just like a uh, kind of a lean decision boundary um, after running a certain sample. So now what if we uh, kind of change our decision boundary? So we calculate the cumulative risk based on each of the samples. Yes. That seems to be on, on the projector, the color sounds really coming out. Oh. Yeah, so I think maybe we have to. Oh, yeah. That's okay. I mean, the previous, yeah. the previous one. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. So yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, I didn't realize it's hard to see. Um, okay. So. Okay, um, sorry about the colors. Um, so, assume, so um, you can probably see this line. So what we do is uh, assume everything up is red colored. Um, so that means that uh, whenever you reach into the decision threshold, so when it go, once, the sorry, once the cumulative lift goes above the threshold, then we stop the test and say, yes, um, there is uh, a difference for treatment and control. Um, and then, so here is that once we reach up to 230, um, if it's lower than the threshold here, then we stop the test and say, uh, no, there isn't any difference between treatment and control. Uh, but if it's above, um, still we say, yes, there is. Sorry, we say there's no difference, and that's, yes, there's difference. Yeah. Um, color seems probably okay. Okay, so um, just keep imagining there is a red area shaded up there. Um, maybe we'll just use this one. So uh, this is uh, what the test will look like um, if we were to use the decision threshold. Uh, uh, so this is what the test will I use that screen there. It's easier for everyone to understand that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yeah. Sorry. I'm just assuming that there is everything above this line. So there is a line here. Everything above is red colored. Yeah. So as soon as, so let's just follow through maybe one line here. So as soon as uh, the cumulative lift cross over into the boundary, then we make a decision and say, yes, there's a difference between treatment and control. Um, so that's where we accept the non sorry, the alternative hypothesis. Yeah. So we can see that if we were to use this decision threshold um, to make a judgment, then something's not going to look very right. So we can see that some of them may be temporarily crossing over into the red zone, but then that will come coming down later. So some of those red lines, those were the ones that went over and then still come downwards. Yeah. So, <laughs> so in this case, um, even if we calculate uh, the decision threshold um, at five percent. Um, so it looks like there's a lot more simulation um, going to reject the null hypothesis um, and say there is an effect. So this is what the power curve will look like um, with picking. So we can see the significance um, now is no longer at five percent. Uh, so that's these two curves here. So the significance is no longer at five percent. It's now at around thirty percent. So, what about what picking means? Okay. So I guess picking means um, you stop the test um, as soon as you get um, a certain significance. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we can see the power curve shifted quite a bit. Uh, we have a very high significance. So there's a thirty percent chance of having very some lift, even though there is really no effect. Um, so um, 
42 dotted lines, um, the ones on the right, uh, this is the average sample number. Um, so we can see that the average sample number decreased quite a lot for the peaking test. Uh, so that's the orange one here. Um, but then we, at the same time, um, the test is not doing well when it comes to the symptoms. Okay, so how do we fix early stopping? So early stopping is a great idea, uh, but we need to make sure that uh, we're doing it correctly um, when it comes to test design. So one of the um, simplest um, test design is called sequential probability ratio test by Walt um, many, many years ago. Um, so the public has an SPR kit. Um, so that's uh, the sequential probability ratio test. So what we're doing here is that we are doing a linear boundary uh, of the test. So uh, the one, so there are kind of two lines here. There's one line here, and then there's another line over here. So what we do is that let's the cumulus we come across. Once it crossed the upper boundary into the upper zone, then we stop the test and we say, uh, yes, there is a difference between treatment and control. Um, but if it goes lower into the zone here, then we also stop the test and say uh, there is no difference between treatment and control. Yeah. So yeah. if it stays kind of in this middle region, uh, then the test just continues. So uh, this is what the test will look like. So this is the, what the test will look like. Um, if we overlay the simulated uh, numbers. So uh, as soon as it kind of goes into the upper boundary, uh, we stop the test and say, yes, there is a difference. Uh, as soon as it goes into the lower boundary, we'll also stop the test and say, uh, no, there is no difference between treatment and control. Um, if it stays kind of in the middle area, uh, then we'll just let the test continue. So in this case, we do not have an idea about how long the test would really run because um, it can have any kind of um, performance really. Um, so a way we want to evaluate uh, the SPRT test um, is also using power code. <coughs> um, so this is what a power code will look like for SPT, uh, sorry, SPRT and T test. Um, so if we just look at the two solid lines here, um, so they will have exactly the same power curve, um, just because we specify, specify the parameters and calculate boundaries, um, it's the same significance, power and lift. Um, but when we look at uh, the average sample number, so the two dotted lines on the right axis, uh, we can see that on average, um, SPRT has about maybe 30 to 60% fewer samples needed compared to a t-test. So for a t-test, uh, the sample size is fixed in advance, but for SPRT um, on average, um, just mention that because SPRT, the number of samples can be anywhere between, let's say, five to a billion. Um, so on average, uh, you'll be a lot less uh, compared to a uh, t-test. But one of the issues uh, with SPRT, uh, you're probably kind of thinking now, is um, there is a chance that the test will never stop. What if we're just really unlucky and got stuck in the middle zone? Um, in this case, um, there's a way we can fix it. So um, on the... Okay, um, so on the left here, this is the SPRT decision boundaries. So we have um, an upper boundary for uh, accept H1, and then a lower boundary for accepting the null hypothesis. Uh, the triangular test, in this case, um, the, it's kind of like a triangular shape. So up to like this. Yeah. So when it goes into higher, so it's kind of the same decision rule, except now the decision boundary uh, it forms a triangular shape. So this is kind of the region where we let the test continue. Yeah, sorry about the color again. <laughs> um, so uh, before, uh, for a classical t-test, um, the sample number is 230. Um, for a triangular test, uh, the maximum sample number might be around 400. Um, so it's, there is a chance that it will be uh, you'll need higher sample numbers compared to a t-test. 
uh, but then again, compared to SPRT, at least we know that's the maximum number that's going to be needed. Okay, so this is what uh, the uh, graphs will look like for our simulated data. Uh, when we compare kind of uh, the triangle, what was the triangle attempt? Yep, um, and then here's what the power curve um, and every sample number curve will look like for uh, the three different tests. So the solid lines, again, these are the power curve. Um, they're pretty much the same. Uh, we're using simulated data uh, to calculate the power curve. Uh, so they may have little gaps, but in theory, they should be exactly the same. Um, when we look at uh, the average sample number for t-test and sorry for the three tests, uh, we can see that t-test on average, um, so t-test is always 230 samples needed um, for the triangle and SPRT. Uh, the average sample number is still lower than t-test. Uh, triangle on average will use a little bit more samples uh, compared to SPRT, uh, but then at least in here, the maximum number of samples is no. Um, maybe I won't talk much about Bayesian test and just, I think, um, I don't think I'll talk much about the Bayesian test, um, but I think the idea is someone is very interested. Um, one of the conclusions that Bayesian is very heavily influenced by your prior assumptions. So this is probably a bit too much knowledge for, <laughs> for my, me as well. But, um, but yeah, I think just um, one thing to note is that uh, power curve and then the average sample number curve is very good in terms of interpreting your test results and validating it. Okay, um, <laughs> coming to uh, our summaries here. Um, so uh, just to summarize what we talked about today, um, it's very useful to simulate power curve for any proposed test. Um, one thing we learned uh, when doing A-B testing um, in e-commerce settings and in real business world is that if you were to do a Google search um, on A-B testing, and then look at different um, vendor softwares. Uh, there are a lot of confusing materials online. Um, some of them may or may not be right. Um, so it's probably a good idea to um, kind of validate uh, any proposed approach uh, using power curve. And also it's a very good way to compare different tests. Um, the next very important thing is that make sure the, large, uh, the test is large enough to detect the kind of lift you want. Uh, if you're doing a very simple complex UI change, um, then very commonly the number of samples needed will be over 200K. Uh, but then if you want certain accuracies, uh, then that's definitely important uh, to take into consideration. Um, also that if your sample size is really not large enough, then there's a very high chance of getting a false discovery. Um, so sequential tests, um, let's back to the third point. Uh, sequential tests um, pretty much always perform better than fixed duration tests. Uh, triangle ones can be used um, as a way to control the maximum number of samples needed um, in case for a certain limit boundary SPRT in our end. Um, I think that's pretty much everything. I think not all the Bayesian stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, I think that's everything. Thank you so much everyone for listening. Thank you for sharing. Um, I know you said at the beginning there's a disclaimer not to set the best practice uh, here, but I'm interested to hear your views around um, A, B, and A, B, C test. <laughs> um, so what I meant was um, you are testing a particular feature by splitting into A and B group, but uh, have you tried out, say, taking price adjustment as example, like 5%, 10%, 15%, like multi-variant uh, um, testing? Yeah. Um, yeah. What are the standard practice <laughs> based on yeah. Yeah, your um, yeah, I to send any kind of standard practice, um, but I think the underlying philosophy would uh, still be the same. Um, the underlying statistics um, about the testing, uh, the philosophies uh, would still apply. Yeah, yes, in our daily life, we do kind of different testings. Um, 
and then it was more plant change points at 5% symptoms, etc. Um, I think there are different approaches um, when we kind of do that. For example, we analyze the elasticities over time uh, for different plant change tests, but I think that's kind of like a different uh, topic um, for this. Yeah, but I think uh, overall, still coming back to this, um, the number of variants uh, probably won't change the uh, kind of the approach of this task again. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, on the plot where you were showing the SPRT, yeah. um, it looks like the, the number of samples required was peaking at around a true lift of 5%. Uh, I think it was the previous one you had up before. You were showing SPRT and well, the one that also has triangle as well has the same phenomenon. I think they both peak at about 5%. Yeah. Up, back. Sorry. <laughs> that one. No. <laughs> It's on the one where it's got the mountain. The, the, power, curve, the, power, the power curves. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Yeah. yeah. This one? It's peaking yeah. at 5%. And I'm wondering if you, what's driving that in both cases? Is that an artifact because you simulated at a true lift of 10%? Is it something about that that's driving that? Uh, yeah, sorry, I got a point. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Yes. Uh, in this, in this, uh, yes, in this setting, we set uh, the, no, sorry, I'm just thinking. Uh, so yeah, because we specify the task uh, based on a 10% lift of power 80%, um, and then our signal points at 5%. Um, in this case, the problem when it's around 5% is the hardest uh, when crossing to different boundaries. Yes, does it make sense? Yeah. Um. So kind of, I suppose, outside the context of the slides here, in your, in your sort of day-to-day -day experience, yeah. how much of a challenge is, is sort of controlling and matching the, the A and the B sample um, in, in production? How do you go about that? Sorry, did you have the last time? Yeah, so, sorry, so when you when you, you know, you've come up with the test, you've got the A and the B plant changes, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, how, have you, do you find challenges in choosing who is A and who is B or making sure that the, the A and the B sample are, are matched? Uh, yeah, so um, I think so uh, in, well, I guess it depends on which world you live in, on the kind of different tests you can specify, whether it's kind of like unpaired uh, or paired or one sample, two sample test. Um, so I think what we discussed here is mostly around um, unpaired uh, two sample tests. That's kind of what we do um, at Color Genius, um, mostly in our daily work. Um, I think so we most likely do kind of a randomized allocation uh, based on device ID or device fingerprint. Um, so we want to make sure that the same customers get allocated to um, the same kind of control or treatment group. Um, so this is kind of the best we could do um, in kind of the commercial setting. Um, there are definitely customers who if you're using different devices, then they will fall into both control or treatment. Um, that's just kind of something unavoidable <laughs> in nature. Yeah. Um, or sometimes if you, depends on the kind of test, I've also seen people doing allocation based on, for example, IP address, um, based on the, sorry, the suburb or the location of an IP address for different cities. Uh, but then that's kind of a variation of the test where your treatment and control might not match exactly um, as you kind of run them out and then allocate. Thank you. No worries. Um, hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I probably have a very dumb question. Probably I didn't say well in the statistics. Um, do you mind going back to the uh, first few slide where you show the price simulation? Uh, sorry, not the price, but the simulation. Um, yeah. Sorry, not the price. So just wonder how do we construct those simulated paths? Uh, okay, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so what we do is that let's assume we have a baseline of 20%, 25% conversion rate. So uh, let's assume that we simulate 230 samples of it. So we got um, a random number assigned to each of the 230 samples, and we see whether it's converted or not converted. So we have a zero and one outcome for 230 based on 25%. Um, let's say we want to do a simulation for the 10% lift, 
then we have another kind of 10 set of samples, 230 samples, and then we simulate uh, using a random, uh, sorry, we're using 35% uh, uh, conversion rate, so we get only 0 and 1. And what we do is that we have all the samples together, then we calculate the difference for each of the samples, and then we simulate them all the time. So for the first samples on the control, first sample on the treatment, uh, we calculate the difference, and the next one will count the difference again, we sum up the difference over time. Right. So I remember. Oh, question? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, I'm still slightly puzzled. I remember like studying in university about the stock price simulation where um, that the variation would just be the like the volatility. Is that a similar concept here or is like totally different? Well, we kind of assume that each of the samples is independent of yeah. each other. For stocks wise, normally you would assume certain correlation. Um, I think what you're asking is why doesn't the volatility go away as you get more samples of it or not? Or... Um, yeah, I mean, the question is, I suppose, as you go for greater sample sizes, why doesn't it sort of converge to a. Because, you know, every extra, um, every extra test should mean yeah, you get less volatility. I guess uh, so. Um, so I think so. This is only like fifty simulated paths. So if we were to let's say simulate for fifty k, and then if we look at a distribution at two hundred thirty over time, so that will normally form a normal distribution at two hundred when we got two hundred thirty samples. So that's all centered around zero, and then that's kind of like a normal distribution around. That's so. so that's an answer question. <laughs> I, yeah. I suppose let, I'm just my question. If you're on one of those lines, mm -hmm. if I go from, is it still the same observations on that line at the hundred as there are in the two hundred? So do those hundreds still make part of the two hundred? Yes, they will still make part so, of the on the same line. That will still make yeah. part of yeah. that. But it's yeah. a cumulative lift, so there will be more samples coming in, and then the cumulative lift will change. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sophia, and thank you all for coming to yet another exciting edition of Data Science Sydney. We're going to have one more event before the end of the year. Bill is encouraging me to run a social event rather than a presentation event. How do people feel about that? Who wants more presentations in December? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants drinks and networking? Nobody will know. You could have an open compromise. Too <laughs> <laughs> big lightning. Oh, you want you want some lightning? Who wants to do lightning talks? Who feels like they have something in them that needs five minutes of? Extreme expression. A little bit of lightning around social. <laughs> so, um, is anyone here not a member of the meetup group? Um, a gentle uh, reminder to please join the meetup group. Um, the meetup group itself has been a great way in the past of keeping up to date with Data Science Sydney events, but the reality is that a lot of people are just not getting their emails. And I keep talking to people and saying, Are you coming to Data Science Sydney? And they go, Really? There's something on? I didn't get the email. For this reason, for this reason, I will ask you to please also join the Data Science Sydney LinkedIn group because this gives you another way of staying up to date. And there will be a Twitter channel shortly as well. I should call it X, shouldn't I? <laughs> All right. Um, are there any announcements? Does anyone have any job placements or any other announcements they want to make? Was that a hand going up, Dimitri? Do you have an announcement, Dimitri? I thought I saw a hand. <laughs> All right. Any anyone else? No. All right. Well, um, I think we'll still have maybe five or ten minutes of networking here until the institute gently switches the lights out to tell us to leave. <laughs> Whereupon we'll go to the pub that's sort of diagonally across the road for those who are interested. Um, please hang around if you want, or go home. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you.
which which is kind of saying um same john from playground x y yeah yeah if you do more you get a 